there among the masterpieces of our past. But what is genuine? And what is fake? I found to my shock that so many pieces that, in my opinion, were ancient were not ancient. These works of art were found by ambitious archaeologists. Arthur Evans excavates the Palace of Knossos. He makes sensational discoveries and raises money for new excavations. And he is knighted by King George V. In contrast, Luigi Pernier excavates at Phaestos, and he doesn't find anything really spectacular. Funding threatens to dry out until he is able to present the Phaestos disc, the oldest written artifact in Europe. It was an incredible achievement of Pernier, who managed to excavate the entire palace in just a few years. It was for glory and for cash. Evans and Pernier have brilliant restorers at their side. Girion, father and son. Did this quartet reinvent our past? In 1900, Arthur Evans starts work on excavating the Palace of Knossos. The British archaeologist has purchased a piece of land near Heraklion for this purpose. Evans is clearly interested in more than just archaeology. Prestige back home is also important to him. He quickly produces some spectacular finds, evidence of an ancient high culture which had previously only been described in myths and legends. According to the ancient tales, the labyrinth of Knossos was home to the Minotaur, half man and half bull, who lurked there waiting for human sacrifices. Evans is thrilled by the discovery, and for him there is no doubt that the ruins of a magnificent culture will now re-emerge on the island of Crete, the empire of King Minos, in ancient times symbolizing luxury and abundance. Meanwhile, in the south of Crete, Italian archaeologists have rediscovered the Palace of Phaestos. For them, in this period of nationalism, the reputation of Italian archaeology is at stake. Just as Arthur Evans did in Knossos, the chief excavator, Luigi Pernier, is determined to find something unique, and Pernier achieves his aim. Today, in the Cretan capital Heraklion, his disc forms the main attraction for visitors to the National Museum, an icon of Minoan culture, comparable to the bust of Nefertiti in Berlin. However, dissent can be heard to this very day. Some people claim the Phaistos disc is a hoax. But if that is true, who could have been involved? The British archaeologist had the experienced restorer Emile Girolon at his side, and the popular image we have today of Minoan life is due to Girolon's work under Evans' supervision. But was it really like that? Today, experts are critical of Girolon's methods. Emile Girolon's staggering career begins in 1877, when the Swiss man arrives in Athens. The city is undergoing an astonishing revival during this decade. Now that Greece is independent from the Ottoman Empire, wealthy citizens are investing in education and the arts. In the shadow of the Acropolis, a millionaire who is later to achieve great fame has a magnificent villa constructed. Heinrich Schliemann made a fortune trading in golden arms. Now he plans to make a dream from his youth come true by rediscovering Troy and Mycenae, the cities of Homer's heroes. The young Emile Girard hopes to find employment with Schliemann. Schliemann tests his abilities. At least, this is the story that has come down to us. The archaeologist presents Girard with three fragments from a fresco and demands nothing less than a reconstruction of the entire picture. At first, Giron is bewildered, but then Emile produces a sophisticated reconstruction from his own imagination. 
He draws a charioteer with a spear. Schliemann is delighted. That's what it must have looked like. But then Giron suddenly sketches a temple guard. What's more, this isn't the last draft. He carries on producing various alternatives until the irritated Schliemann finally hires him. After Schliemann's death, Arthur Evans has Giron brought to Crete. Evans has experienced a stroke of good fortune. Not long after starting the excavations, he made some significant finds. Now the fragments need to be reconstructed. Emile Giron can carry on in Knossos in the same way that he worked for Schliemann. His son accompanies him to Crete. The young man is also called Emile. The island is a paradise for archaeologists. Emile Jr. trains his eye on classical structures which have just been excavated and on the expressive faces of the locals. It becomes apparent that young Emile has inherited from his father not only a talent for drawing, but also entrepreneurial skills. And a certain unscrupulous attitude when dealing with the truth, as later critics will claim. Giron is quite prepared to make his employer a hero, if that's what he wants. Emile Jr. draws incessantly, neatly, and with an obsession for detail. Years later, he will take his father's place in the team that is tirelessly excavating Knossos. For four decades, father and son Giron dominate the image of ancient Crete that has become known worldwide and is still popular today, despite its discrepancies. That of a paradise island in the midst of the wine-dark sea, a fair land and a rich, begirt with water, as the poet Homer proclaimed. The French Archaeological Institute in Athens is a meeting point for artists and scientists. Its director is Alexandre Farnou. Only a few days ago, the archaeologist gained access to the former private archives of the Giron family, so he can provide an expert evaluation. This is the order book of Gilleron Sr. It's the original form of the catalogue used by the Gillerons to offer copies of the archaeological finds. This book contains all the important objects discovered during the excavations, complete with photographs of the restored pieces and explanations. Here, for example, it says, vase from Pylos, documented by the former German archaeologist Müller. Then it states the size of the vase and price. For a long time, archaeologists were only able to provide reasonably accurate depictions of the original archaeological finds with the help of illustrators who sketched them and used watercolors. So Giron Sr. is in the right place at the right time and with the right people to develop his talents to the full. He has to capture the shades of color and the intensity precisely at the moment of discovery. The skillful illustrator quickly finds an artistic mode of expression for the style of Bronze Age Crete. At least, the way his boss, Evans, pictures the empire of King Minos. This is a drawing by hand made directly from the original of the fresco with the outlines of the excavated fragments and the additions that Gilleron has suggested in order to recreate the picture. The Minoan tradition of bull leaping involved acrobats racing straight towards the animal and jumping over it. This dangerous practice was part of the religious cult rituals and could end in death. Europe and the USA quickly became gripped by Cretan fever. 
The newly discovered works of art inspire artists and fashion designers, although others dismiss it all as merely a kind of archaeological fantasy land. The Gillerons produced drawings as if on a conveyor belt, which they then embellished with watercolors. Here's the famous detail from the procession fresco. It was a kind of exercise in graphics, which was then reproduced and sold everywhere in Europe. The lily prints is a revealing example of Giron's working method. Giron simply reinvented the figure. In the case of the Lily Prince fresco, we now know precisely that it has in fact been composed from completely different frescoes. Gilleron did it because that's what Evans wanted in order to illustrate the Minoan Empire. And we experts are still impressed by it, even though the background is much better known today. Arthur Evans continues to excavate. Utterly convinced that he has a mission to perform, Evans hardly appears bothered by scruples. non minoan architecture is simply disposed of. He names rooms at the palace at his sole discretion. When an alabaster throne is found, Evans immediately declares it to be the throne of King Minos although there is no evidence of the throne's function or even of the existence of King Minos. He doesn't have to wait long to achieve recognition back home. King George V knights him. Luigi Panier has far greater difficulties to deal with. In the south of the island where he is excavating, the coastline is bleak and uninviting. The early archaeologists here have to be good climbers because many of the sites are in remote valleys or on high mountains where access is extremely difficult. Beyond the mountains lies the Libyan Sea. This ocean connected the Minoans with the developed cultures of the Near East and Egypt, but it also provided protection against foreign invaders. Professor Diamantis Panagiotopoulos has been studying the history of Crete in this area for decades. His arduous expeditions along dusty tracks have proved worthwhile because away from the major palace complexes, there are many cult sites that have still hardly been subject to expert investigation. The mountains along the coast were always a bulwark. In the past, they held back invaders intent on attacking Crete, while today they make it difficult for curious travelers to make any progress. The inhabitants of Crete have always formed a closed community towards strangers. At the same time, Anyone who wants to excavate here could hardly make any progress without local assistance. The Greek professor from Heidelberg has many friends on the island. The knowledge they share with him has been passed down from generation to generation. Countless caves lie hidden in the mountains. In many cases, the entrances are only known to shepherds. The Cretans have always regarded caves as sacred places. Gods were born in them, including the father of all the gods, Zeus. Archaeologists still come across surprising finds in these sacrificial sites. Double-sided cult axes made from bronze or gold. And bare-breasted priestesses in clay. Or are these representations of goddesses? They provide fuel for the myth that Crete was a matriarchy, a society governed by women. <music> Professor Panagiotopoulos's excavation site is at the edge of the mountains above the Misara plain. Today, many of the locals are leaving the area. A large number of villages have been abandoned. However, during the Minoan period, 
there was a flourishing settlement here on the hilltop. The remains have been excavated and studied. What interests us is the question why a certain region was of great importance at some periods in history, while in other periods it was abandoned. It is not due to the climate. This has hardly changed on Crete over the last 4,000 years. And yet, after the decline of the Minoan culture, Crete never again achieved the importance it had enjoyed during its golden age. Crete is still a puzzle for us archaeologists, even 100 years after the first major discoveries at the beginning of the 20th century. It's pretty amazing that a developed culture arose here, which could justifiably be compared with the great cultures of the Orient. For thousands of years, the fertile soil of the Misara Plain has been a source of prosperity. This was the basis of both the cultural development and political power. Crete is on the crossroads of ancient trading routes. Since the Cretans had a large fleet of ships, trade with people all around the Mediterranean flourished. This was how the first major culture of Europe arose, with its population established early on in centers such as Knossos and Phaistos. And Phaistos is where the greatest puzzle of the Minoan Empire was found, Luigi Pernier's disc. Italian archaeology on Crete began in a very special historical situation. Greece had achieved independence from Turkey in the middle of the previous century. Then Crete was divided into several protectorates, Italian, French and British. It was due to this environment that archaeologists from Italy were able to work without any obstacles. These early archaeologists, like Luigi Pernier, had to explore Crete on the back of donkeys. They had to struggle against malaria, and other unimaginable difficulties. In the year 1900, when Luigi Pernier lands on Crete, the island is still officially ruled by the Ottoman Turks. At that time, the idea that the first high culture of Europe had once blossomed here appears unbelievable. And yet Pernier discovers evidence of this past everywhere. During the Roman period, the Misara Plain was ruled from Gortin. Here is the Great Code, the oldest legal text in Europe. This was rediscovered by Federico Halper, a leading Italian archaeologist. Originally, Pernier worked for him. This find was to make Halper famous. In Phaistos, Luigi Pernier is at first only the deputy on excavations led by Halper. Pernier is regarded as extremely ambitious. He is descended from a family of Roman aristocrats with French roots. His opportunity arises when Halper becomes involved in a political intrigue. The affair leaves Pernier the new boss in Phaistos. He prepared for his mission at the famous Sapienza University in Rome, studying literature and archaeology. Today, the linguist and archaeologist Alessandro Greco teaches here. During the period from 1800 to 1700 BC, Crete was a cultural focal point. This was known as the New Palace period, when the major structures were built whose ruins can still be seen today. It was in these palaces that archaeologists found clay tablets with what became known as Linear A script. And despite decades of research, to this day, it has not been possible to decipher this written language. Alessandro Greco is therefore obliged to try a different route, 
he is analyzing all visual information that has been found so far in order to gain knowledge about the religion, social structure, and everyday life of the Minoans. His main problem here is that virtually all authentic images are only available in miniature format. We don't know who's depicted here. Is it a king or queen, a prince or a god? And we don't know how their minds worked. Even the visual language of the rings is still puzzling. The function is known. They were used by rulers to place their seals on documents and letters. At Heidelberg University, Professor Diamantis Panagiotopoulos is evaluating his series of excavations. He occupies the famous chair of classical archaeology here. The practical work of an archaeologist includes analyzing and archiving the finds. In Heidelberg, a scientific mega-project is being performed involving 130 experts from 13 countries. This is the famous Corpus of Minoan and Mycenaean Seals, a gigantic collection of data including hundreds of thousands of photographic negatives and 9,000 prints from clay seals. It's a collection of the most varied materials, forms, and above all patterns in the images on clay seals, which provides us with a wealth of extremely important information about the social structures, ideologies, and mentalities of these societies. Of course, there are a number of signet rings which cannot be guaranteed in terms of authenticity. We compare these problematic examples with seals from systematic archaeological excavations, objects which have been proven to be authentic. The work of these experts often resembles the proverbial search for a needle in a haystack. The collection also contains a ring with an inscription that has not been deciphered. The spiral shape and script form resembles that of the Phaestus disc. Does this ring indicate that Pernier's mysterious clay disc is genuine? One of the problematic examples is the Ring of Minos, which has been suspected for many years of being a forgery. Arthur Evans brought the gold ring from a priest, although many experts warned him against doing so. Today, the Ring of Minos is in Heraklion Museum. If it really is a modern forgery, who might the forger have been? In this case, too, the name of Girion is on the list of main suspects. Were the Girions engaged in forgery for decades? Final proof is contained in the Heraklion Museum, but it cannot be accessed. The British archaeologist and linguist Gareth Owens has made Crete his second home. The focus of his research is on early scripts from the Minoan period, like the disc. The Phaistos Palace complex exerts an almost magic attraction over him. The Minoan civilization of the second millennium BC is based around the palatial economy and the palaces like we are here in Phaistos is the center of bureaucracy and religion. Gareth Owens knows every inch of the ruined palace. For decades, he has studied each detail here, such as the so-called Queen's Throne Room. Pitoi like this were used to store the commercial wealth of the Cretans. To this day, traditional urns are produced from clay, as they have been for thousands of years. The craftsmen in the ancient palace workshops became masters of this art, and their reputation even reached as far as the court of the Egyptian pharaohs, who ordered clay vases and silver bowls from Crete.
The Minoan palaces and the economy of Crete is based very much on agricultural products, very excellent olive oil and wine, still very good today indeed. They were keeping it here in the storerooms. They were exporting throughout the Mediterranean very widely indeed, travelling throughout the Mediterranean Sea, very, very international. The first palace was very rich, destroyed about 1700 BC, which is probably the date of the Festos disc, and it's no surprise that writing is developed in this southern part of Crete. This first palace at Festos was constructed in 1900 BC. 200 years later, a huge earthquake caused it to collapse. The doors and ceilings were made of wood, and they were set on fire by the flames from the oil lamps. It must have been an inferno. Although the building has been constructed in a special way, it could not withstand the massive earthquake. The fire spread at incredible speed. The inhabitants fled in panic. But nevertheless, many did not survive. The entire palace complex was ruined. The Festus Disney is part of that destruction horizon, importantly, deliberately baked, not accidentally baked, like the destruction level that saved the other linear tablets, was actually found with a linear tablet and with really nice Camaris style pottery, and this part of the palace seems to be for storing valuable objects. It was found lying together with numerous other artifacts, indicated to Pernier that the disc had fallen from one of the upper stories. But attempting to reconstruct the catastrophe scenario raises new problems. How could a fragile clay disc survive a fall of several meters and crash down onto a hard stone floor without any apparent damage? A crucial question that neither Luigi Pernier nor his successor in Festus were ever able to answer satisfactorily. In New York, Jerome Eisenberg deals in ancient artifacts. This internationally renowned specialist has spent decades studying items to establish whether they are genuine or forgeries. It's been fired very thoroughly, very evenly, and the only time ancient tablets were fired was during a fire, and they'd be unevenly uh, fired. The edges are very, very uh, sharp, and you wouldn't have any ancient tablet, anything made out of clay with sharp edges that could easily be damaged. It had too many things wrong with it. If you have two or three things that don't make sense, I can accept it. But when you have eight or nine different things that are wrong with the piece, then I certainly would condemn it as a forgery. If Heisenberg's suspicions are correct, it would mean that Luigi Pernier falsified the exploration record. However, it is also conceivable that he himself was tricked. To this day, it has not been established exactly who was present at the excavation when the object was found. Alessandro Greco thinks it inconceivable that Pernier himself faked the object. It was an incredible achievement of Luigi Pernier's to excavate and even evaluate the entire palace within the space of just a few years. In addition to his excavation activities, Luigi Pernier was also employed in Florence as an antiques inspector. His jurisdiction included the city's archaeological museum. Finds from the Etruscan period have pride of place in the collection here. The Etruscans were among the most powerful people around the Mediterranean. Paolo Rendini is a specialist in Etruscan script. In the magazine, Dr. Rendini and the museum director study one of the most valuable items, the Magliano disc. It represents one of the most important examples of Etruscan script. Today, the 70 words can be read, while in the days of Luigi Pernier, this was not possible. At eight centimeters in diameter, it is half the size of the Phaistos disc. The words and sentence sections are separated by dots. 
while on the Phaistos disc, vertical lines are used. It was found at the end of the 19th century in 1882. The Archaeological Museum in Florence bought it in 1888. It's an extraordinary object because the disc is made of lead. It measures 8 by 7 centimeters. This isn't very large, but it contains one of the oldest examples of Etruscan writing known to us. Near the location where this was found, an Etruscan cemetery was discovered with even older graves from the late 7th and early 6th century BC. This cult object originated a thousand years after the palace fire in Phaestus. Cultural exchange between Etruscans and Minoans would appear extremely unlikely. Consequently, the great similarity between the two discs is inexplicable. However, while he was working in Florence, Luigi Pernier could have studied the Magliano disc extensively before he discovered the Faustus disc in Crete. As far as Jerome Eisenberg is concerned, this is a crucial clue. It has many unique characteristics. It has nothing to do with any other work of ancient art. Uh, physically, it's the only large disc that's found in the Near East or in the Mediterranean area. Nobody can decide what it is and where it came from. One of Pernier's successors at the Italian excavation site in Festos also finds the disc extremely puzzling. The disc is a unique object with a unique inscription for Crete and the entire eastern Mediterranean. It's a script that features open syllables like Kake Kiko Ku or Tate Tito Tu. It probably originated in Crete because all other Cretan scripts, such as linear A and B, are also the open syllable type. In the Heraklion Museum, the disc is the main attraction. It is 3,600 years old, according to the museum. The inscription is said to be a prayer a record of battles or an archive register. What is known for certain is that the disc has a diameter of 16 centimeters and is stamped with 45 different symbols arranged in a spiral from the outer rim to the center, forming a total of 242 stamped impressions. Too many signs for an alphabet, too few signs for a system like Chinese or Egyptian. So what we decided to do was to try to progress with systematic epigraphic work. So if a sign is the same in different scripts, it has the same sound value. And those 45 signs, the sound values, can be found amongst the 90 sound values of linear B, which is a script of roughly the same time, from the same place, which has been deciphered. While the linguistics expert believes there may soon be a breakthrough, Jerome Eisenberg sees examples of suspicious errors. This inscription basically goes from right to left, as in Egyptian hieroglyphs. On the other hand, Minoan script, a linear A and linear B are read from left to right. These are all too highly realistic to be in an ancient script. This is an interesting symbol. This is a uh, gloved hand or a castus in Latin, which only occurs in the Roman period, which is about 1,500 years later. They just don't make sense together. If Jerome Eisenberg is right, how could the forger have achieved this? It must have been somebody familiar with classical script types. Obtaining the raw material for the clay disc wouldn't have been a problem. There are potters close to Phaestus. If the price were high enough, they would have remained silent. Luigi Pernier had access to the excavation records and might have desired the fame for himself and for Italy. Whether he had the necessary handicraft skills to produce the forgery himself is doubtful. While the spiral pattern almost looks as though it was produced by a child, 
the symbols were printed with seals molded in a sophisticated process. Jerome Eisenberg believes Panier commissioned the work at most. It was said that uh, Gilly Aron was present at the time the disc was discovered and that Pernier was not, that he was probably taking a nap. The exact circumstances when the Phaestos disc was found can't be established definitively. No archaeologist was a direct witness. It may be significant that the Girons are once again directly implied in archaeological forgery. Did their greed overpower their moral scruples? Evidence of the Giron salesmanship can be found in the Humboldt University in Berlin. The archaeologist Nadine Becker is researching the purchase of artifacts by the university during the pre-war period. The Winkelmann Institute is proud of its lavishly made copies from the Giron workshops. They are objects of study for experts and students. All in original sizes, like the throne of King Minos. These exclusive replicas came at a price. Catalogues, purchase orders and correspondence with the Girons have been preserved to this day in the archives. Original invoices and customs documentation indicate the astonishing sums the Girons demanded, which were paid by the buyers. Using a process which was technically revolutionary at the time, the metal copies were produced by a galvanoplastic method in the Württemberg metalware factory WMF. The Girions sold the exclusive items to their international customers for outrageous prices. But the Girons did not only place replicas on the market. Experts at the renowned museums of Boston and Toronto have also found indications of criminal activities. The museum purchased her in 1931. She's a beautiful piece of work, isn't she? Sir Arthur Evans called her Our Lady of Sports. You know, another interesting thing here is the fact that she's wearing this gold cod piece. Now, that cod piece, in fact, is a penis sheath. Oh, not quite appropriate. Not entirely appropriate. And it's also interesting that the majority of the ivories that turned up you know, early in the 20th century AD are female figures. And this is because Sir Arthur Evans was very much uh, looking for representations of a prominent female deity his mother goddess, and that's probably why he called her Our Lady of Sports, because it's a direct reference to the Virgin Mary. The Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Here too, an ivory figure from the Minoan period was part of the collection, until recently. It has now been banished to the archives. Quite a come down for the snake goddess. So what made you suspicious? Especially strange is the damage to her face. The proper left side, you can see, has kind of sheared away. And ivory flakes, this is what ivory does. Mm -hmm. But the features that survive there are centered on what survives. Mm -hmm. But if that damage took place after the carving rather than before the carving, what survives should be asymmetrical or damaged. The scientific analyses are quite interesting, and I was really surprised when they came back. If the statuette is ancient, the ivory should date to about 1450 BC. When the results came back, they were really surprising because they did come back at 1450, but AD, not BC. <laughs> so the ivory that was tested, if not a corrupt sample, is far too recent to be ancient Minoan ivory. So who do you think made her? Well, it would have to be someone who is very familiar with the archaeological material. Mm -hmm. 
I believe that the father-son team, the GRO, who worked for Evans and had a very profitable business in making replicas, were well positioned to create forgeries like this. Jerome Eisenberg feels this investigation confirms his views. I attended an exhibition of ancient art in Boston and Cambridge, and I was shocked at how many pieces, in my opinion, were forgeries. Between 1958 and 1965, I bought some 40,000 pieces, and of, of those, some 22,000 came out of Egypt, and I became rather expert on detecting the forgeries. Our visitors to the museum in Heraklion, admiring a sophisticated forgery, as Jerome Eisenberg claims, However, recent archaeological discoveries could indicate that the disc is genuine. A bronze axe is also kept in Heraklion. On the head of the double axe, there are three lines with overlapping signs engraved upon them. Linguistic experts like Gareth Owens see a parallel here with the stamped symbols on the disc. Gareth Owens and his colleagues have withdrawn to within sight of ancient Phaestus in order to resolve the last mystery of the oldest script in Europe. Now he believes he has finally achieved the breakthrough. He considers that the text on the disc can be deciphered and read. What we have here is definitely a Minoan prayer because we found these words elsewhere on Minoan Crete as well. We have a Minoan prayer for a goddess. My suspicion is that it could be the Minoan Astarte. And Ikwe Kuria, which is the key word on the Festus disc, could well mean pregnant goddess. Ikwe is known from Linear B to be the word for goddess. And Kuria, Kiria, could be the word for pregnant. This wouldn't be surprising when we think that the words on the Festus disc were also found on the top of mountains where Minoan people were making dedications, tamata, to the goddess on the top of the mountains. Another attribute of Astarte, she is the queen of the mountain. Mount Euctus towers over Knossos. The mountain is a magical place. It is said that the father of the gods, Zeus, is buried here. For thousands of years, people have been attracted to the mountain peak, which, from a distance, resembles a sleeping man. Gareth Owens also returns to this place repeatedly. On one side of the mountain, an orthodox chapel with three naves was constructed. Archaeologists then discovered that a sacred edifice with three naves stood on the same site during the Minoan period, almost 4,000 years ago. fascinating to look at the offerings and think that what the Greek Orthodox people are doing today is similar to what the Minoans were doing 36 centuries ago. People don't change. They worry about the same thing. There's continuity. People are worried about their health and they're asking a higher power for help. And some of the words that have been found on the Minoan inscription on the same holy mountain on a very small libation offering that they were doing then, and they were dedicating with parts of the body, but at that time made from clay, not just from silver, have been also been found on the B-side of the Festos disc. Not long ago, an apparently insignificant sacrificial bowl was discovered. Linguistic symbols that had not been encountered previously are engraved on it, and they are almost identical to those on the disc. A forger a hundred years ago could not possibly have known these signs. Does this mean the disc is now accepted as genuine? The Festos disc is um, a problem. The clay is not the same clay as found on Crete. We don't know where the clay came from because we don't have an analysis of it. And the museum will not allow us to take any tests on the uh, disc or even to handle it. Berlin, the Egyptian museum. Rumors have begun to circulate that the bust of the beautiful Nefertiti is a forgery. 
a scientific investigation will provide a definitive answer, despite the high risk of moving the precious object. With great care and with extensive security measures in place, the highlight of the museum is taken to the Charité Hospital in Berlin. Here, the bust of the woman, reputed to be the most beautiful of all, is subjected to computer tomography. The proof that is so important for the museum island of Berlin is now forthcoming. The world-famous bust is not a fake from modern times. The risk and the expense have been worthwhile. The Museum Halle is also posed with a problem. The museum houses what it believes is a sensational object, the Nebra Sky Disk, a bronze disk adorned with representations of the heavenly bodies in gold. This incredible find was brought to light by grave robbers, and now there are claims that the disk could be a forgery. An analysis using scientific techniques will resolve the matter. The extensive technical study is performed in the Bessie Particle Accelerator in Berlin. By employing high-intensity X-rays, the composition of the gold plating can be determined without damaging it. In this way, conclusive proof is obtained. The sky disk is the oldest known calendar of mankind. What about the disk, which is the main attraction in Heraklion? On the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the disk, 1908 to 2008, I wrote again to the director of the museum, and he said that, that since it's a national treasure, it can't be touched or moved. And if that would turn out to be a forgery, it would be a disaster for, oh, for tourism even. Year after year, millions of tourists come to the island of Crete. Tourism is the most important commercial activity, securing half the entire income of the island. Knossos, Festus, and the museum in Heraklion are huge public attractions, important features of this mega business. Critical questions? They are not welcome. Thus it is that an air of suspicion continues to hang over the collection in the National Museum. Is the beautiful world of the Minoans depicted here a mere invention? thought up by Arthur Evans and Luigi Pernier, put into practice by the Girons. At one point, the Girons created the Saffron Gatherer fresco from a few fragments. Further finds prove, however, that the figure depicted here was in fact a monkey. Jerome Eisenberg has no doubt at all about it. The Festos disc is a fake, and Luigi Pernier is a con man. He was in need of funds for excavation. Also, he wanted the glory of having discovered a famous piece. So it was for, it was for glory and for cash. Arthur Evans also complained that he always needed funds and that his discoveries on Knossos aided him to have rich people contribute money. Arthur Evans was able to make his dream come true. For four decades, his very personal vision of the palace of King Minos grew on Crete. He was working also for the fame of the British Empire. And by the end of his life, he was able to call himself Sir Arthur Evans. Even if critics dismiss Knossos as Disneyland, each year, millions of visitors stroll round the structures made of plaster and concrete. Today, however, some archaeologists advocate to dismantle Evans Knossos. Today, the Palace of Knossos is the way it is, and that's the way people imagined the Minoan world in the year 1900. The reputation of the Gillerans deserves to be restored, because our way of judging the history of art from a modern perspective, as if in a courtroom, and condemning it, is unfair. When it comes to any sort of scientific work, you always have to take into account the time of its creation. The fact that the finds of Heinrich Schliemann and Arthur Evans met with such resonance is partly due to the work of the Girons, 
They too have had a crucial influence on our image of Europe's first high culture. The idea that King Minos's Crete was a paradise on earth and his subjects were peaceful art lovers. Like his father, Emile Giron Jr. was never accused of any art forgery. He started a business in Athens. This family company produced successful copies of antique objects right up to modern times. In Phaestos, Gareth Owens has almost achieved his goal after decades of working on the mysterious disc. As far as he is concerned, the disc is one of the most important examples of ancient scripts. We like to think that we are offering a reading that is more secure than has been offered in the past, and we hope people will take advantage of that to move on to the next stage, which is trying to understand. Jerome Eisenberg refuses to be distracted by Gareth Owen's success. I still believe that it's 100% a forgery. There's no question in my mind. The suspicions attached over the decades about the authenticity of his disc didn't appear to damage Panier's career as an archaeologist. For 30 years, he performed research in Phaestus, ignoring all the doubts and all the doubters. <laughs>